Good evening and welcome to Bronx Talk. We have a different sort of program for you tonight. Rather than select a topic for discussion, we're going to focus on one extraordinary Bronx personality. We have with us in the studio one of my colleagues, who is the well-known host of one of BronxNet's most beloved programs, Dialogo Abierto. And also, what many people don't know, he is someone who has achieved in political circles, filmmaking, and social advocacy. He's also the host of an important new BronxNet program, Our Home, Our Haven, Safe Streets, a show that consists of conversations in public forums, analyzing the causes and potential solutions for gun violence in the Bronx. He's an amazing talent, a great guy, and frankly, a wonderful friend. It's my pleasure to reintroduce you in a much different context. He's nervous as can be. As a guest on Bronx Talk, Javier Gomez, nice to have you with us. Thank you, Gary, for inviting me to the program. And yes, I'm nervous. It's very interesting to sit in this chair being yeah, I, interviewed. I, I was asking you, people don't know, I was asking you before uh, the program, what's it like to be sitting here without, a, uh, without the director talking to you? It's different, right? Completely um, different dynamic. No idea what's going to happen, yeah. how are things going to go. No sense of timing. No one is counting me in. Yeah, well, um, we're going to start this way then. But I trust you, so uh, well, I know I will be good okay. Good luck with that. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know how that's going to work out. Um, so where did you grow up? And more importantly, uh, what was it that motivated you to engage in making the commitment to social service and advocacy that has really characterized not only your work here with BronxNet, but um, your work everywhere? I was born in rural Puerto Rico in a small town named Lajas. It's kind of like a fishing village. And uh, my parents had me very late in their lives. I think they were nearly 40. Mm -hmm. So as I was growing up, all of my siblings were far older than I was. So there was a huge generational gap and no one wanted to hang out with this little kid asking questions. So I started to... You were very annoying then too, oh, right? Yes, I was very inquisitive <laughs> and curious. So I started hanging out with adults. Mostly everyone around me wow. were adults. And my parents don't have a, a big education. I think my parent, my mother went as far as sixth grade uh, back in the day. Uh, they were working class, they worked in factories. My father worked in construction and sugar cane fields when they had those in Puerto Rico. But my mother still purchased every single newspaper that was published wow. in Puerto Rico daily, including the San Juan Star, which was in English. So I always grew up surrounded by the news and the constant conversation about what was happening in politics, in the economy, in public safety. So I was a kid that had a, a very big wealth of and vocabulary and knowledge of issues. So it sounds like we credit mom. Yes, yes. I remember when I was a child, my mom, they would read the newspaper upon coming home from work, never in the morning. Right. And I remember I would sit on the floor and whenever they finished reading the paper, they would drop it. And I would be like, oh, wow. and now it's my and, turn to grab the newspaper. And, and you know, um, having hosted the first um, um, Spanish language program uh, on, on BronxNet, um, that's interesting because the papers were in English, so it gave you exposure to English so that it was, pro I'm guessing, easier for you to become bilingual or fully bilingual as you are right now. I think my parents are part of a generation that they did not have back in the day resources to access a lot of formal education, but they had a curiosity and they had a will. And my mother purchased every publication wow. that she could encounter, even the Enquirer. You know, within uh, the first minute of the program, we've already characterized why Javier is so important to BronxNet and to the Hispanic community because of, of this upbringing, which I'm sure rings familiar to so many people in the Bronx. Uh, many people have seen you on TV. They know what you do. Uh, they got the new show. We're going to talk about that and show you a little clip in just a moment. Um, but I was not aware till we had a, a discussion that you've been right in the center of the political world, often unseen, working for borough presidents and governors. Um, what did you learn doing that for years about the political world, why things go right and why things go wrong? Um, it's very interesting because a lot of people used to tell me, but you are a noted journalist, a respected journalist. Why would you want to work for government or elected officials? And, and we're seeing some of them as Freddie Ferrer, Adolfo Carrion, uh, George Pataki. It's uh, many and, years. And Andrew Cuomo. You Andrew told me Cuomo as well. at some point, Karl McCall at some point wow. as well. Uh, what I've learned is that um, as a journalist, as a 
press officer within government and uh, as a deputy press secretary that I was at the time, I learned that I could help be a voice for communities that at the time necessarily were not being noticed and also issues on the street that government necessarily was not noticing. In wow. terms of my collaborators with my colleagues in the media, um, mm -hmm. I became their representative in-house. So even though I was with government, I was functioning as a full reporter, just helping connect, facilitating access for wow. reporters to make sure they got information that was truthful, accurate, and timely. I think for me, there would be a, an endless source of frustration. You're much more mature than I am because I think I would just be, no, you can't do that, don't, don't say that. Um, but you were I able to keep that Freddie in Ferrer, Freddie Ferrer put me uh, on the right track from the very beginning. Uh, I was working as the Bronx reporter for El Diario, the Spanish Daily. Had a little office in the courthouse downstairs every day, shared it with George Fitzgibbon from the Daily News. This was uh, at the, the courthouse time. here in the Bronx? Yeah, in the Supreme Courthouse back in the 90s. Wow. And uh, that's when I was approached by Freddie Ferrer's office, can you do you want to work with us? And I remember in my interview with Ferrer about going work with him as Deputy Press Secretary, he said, we have a very collaborative team and uh, we support each other very much, but there is one thing that we will not tolerate in your work as a press officer. One thing that if you do, all of the support that you have from everyone in the team will be automatically withdrawn. Yes. And, and I said, what is it? And he said that you lie. Oh. If we catch you lying to a member of the working press or misleading or misinforming, you're out. Wow. And that has become my religion and my mantra. I, as a press officer, I'm here to facilitate and connect the dots. Sometimes I can do it easy, sometimes it takes a little bit more time, but that's the deal. Do you, uh, this is fascinating to me that you viewed, you never stopped viewing yourself as an advocate for your community, even though you were literally working for somebody who controlled a lot. Do you recall any issue that maybe you mentioned to either Freddie or Adolfo or uh, one of the governors that they weren't aware of and then they acted on? Or is that too difficult? To, uh, it would be, it's come? difficult to answer specifically because there were a lot of instances. For yeah, example- and it covers a lot of time. Yeah. When I was with uh, Governor Pataki, I recall there was a problem with communities in the Greenwich Village who were uh, upset about people from the Bronx or the outer borough, especially minority communities coming into the piers by the West Side Highway in, just to hang out. Right. And they wanted to shut down the piers, I, I don't know, like. A, 11 o'clock or so, and um, I was able to bring into the conversation there uh, the fact that there's a cultural component to being LGBTQ plus in our neighborhood. So the Greenwich Village and, and had become were, a safe they haven. they were not aware of that They were that not aware culture. of the cultural context, but why are these people hanging out here and not in their neighborhood? And I was very clear, it can get you killed or beat up. Right. And so you, to me, especially he was a Republican governor, but you educated him toward that. I wonder if elected officials would listen to their press secretaries now. I thought it was like a that. fantastic experience and a fantastic opportunity. You, speaking of experience and opportunity, you interviewed Al Gore, <laughs> uh, vice president. Now, was he vice president at the time? Yes. He was vice president at the time. I have to say that, you know, his movie Inconvenient Truth about climate change was unfortunately proven to be all too true, floods and deadly extreme weather all over the globe. Um, what was he like? Were, were, it, was, it was very... Was that for El Diario? That was for El Diario. I was working for a while as El Diario's political reporter stationed at City Hall and one police plaza. So I was alternating both beats certain days a week. So that interview happened in El Puente, an organization in Brooklyn. And that was very important because that interview marks the period when the Bronx, uh, it was during the Roberto Ramirez era at the Democratic when County. he was the head of the Exactly, Democratic so that, that photo marks that moment when the Bronx started gaining national notoriety as, wow. a, as, a, as a big heavy player in politics. And then, therefore, they started allowing members of the working press access that we would have never had before. So here you have me from El Diario sitting with a sitting vice president in the USA who got that moment to sit with him privately. Was it in Washington? No, it was here in, oh. in Brooklyn. 
Oh, in Brooklyn, you said that, right. Uh, all right, so listen, we're, we're moving through a very long career very quickly uh, in, in a matter of th um, uh, 30 minutes. Um, how did you get to Bronx Net Television? Ah, that's, uh, that's a story that I love. Um, I actually... Well, I think we all love that because you're here and you're <laughs> yes. doing great work. So I first arrived in um, Bronx Net as, a, as an assistant producer when the Dialogo, the Spanish language public affairs program, uh, was expanded into a special edition featuring borough president Adolfo Carrion. It was a special half hour, once a month, called Dialogo uh, con el Presidente Carrion, Dialogo with, the bor with Borough President Carrion. And as uh, Deputy Press Secretary for the borough president, I was helping with Glennis and the team at Gl Bronx. Glennis Enriquez was the first host. She was the first host and creator of uh, Dialogo, which, by the way, would not exist if it weren't for Bronx Talk, uh -huh. the pioneering <laughs> show and the longest running show on BronxNet. That is, we, we were the first talk show, and uh, so you told me that earlier, and I, I appreciate that. We just do what we do every week, so that's nice. So she started the show, and then at some point you did a, a, a feature for it? She that? started the show as Dialogo con Glenis, right. or Talks with Glenis. And then uh, it was expanded into this special edition once a month with the borough president. I used to come in and help the production team choose the topics, choose the guests. Back then, it was still with phone calls. Wow. So people would call in with open topics and they could say whatever on air most of the time. And then uh, um, Glennis retired. Uh, I moved on to working for the governor and other personal projects. And then I was hired in 2013. Okay. to be the project coordinator for El Diario Centennial celebration. And uh, a huge project that involved many things, including switching the Empire State Building into the colors of El Diario really? for the night of the Centennial. Wow. One of the proudest things I've done in my life to see when they press that button and the lights and the magically lights change. change. Uh, and I was invited to come on the program, on Dialogo Abierto, by then hosted by Ramon Rodriguez, a colleague. Right. And when we came here to the studio, it turned out that Ramon had retired and no one had informed the guests. Oh, how about him? Exactly, how about this guy? exactly. So uh, the press officers handling that interview apologized and said, we didn't know, by the way, you'd be very good for this. And we spoke to the station and they actually auditioned me. Wow. They had me come in for an interview and an audition. Wow, I don't, I don't even know if I auditioned, although I was, did it so early, they didn't have anybody. They said, all right, take that guy. Uh, um, let's, let's take a quick look at it, and then we'll talk more about uh, Diago, um, uh, Dialogo Abierto, which means open dialogue. Um, feature is a very short clip, but just to see what it's like, featuring our buddy uh, Javier Gomez. Take a look. Hoy conoce a la organización que representa a la industria de las bienes raíces en el Bronx. Se trata de la Asociación de Bienes Raíces del Bronx y el Norte de Manhattan, que ofrece recursos para los profesionales del mundo de las bienes raíces y las personas que desean comprar una vivienda. Nos acompaña Eliezer Rodríguez, director ejecutivo de la asociación. Llega el verano 2019 y con esto la temporada principal de piscinas, parques, recreación, deportes y eventos especiales. Hoy visitamos la sede del Departamento de Parques, donde la comisionada del Bronx, Iris Rodríguez, nos pone al día sobre todo lo que estará ocurriendo. That's, this, that's not me, that's him. It's the same guy. Um, uh, have you counted how many uh, guests you've had, how many shows? So now it's nine years that you've done it. Of course, the program is, is 25 years old. Um, do, you, do you know, tell us something about the scope of it? I actually... Uh, have no idea uh, <laughs> how many guests we've done, but something that I do know for a fact that makes me very proud is that we have worked very hard at featuring an amalgam of voices of uh, every uh, Latin American uh, ethnicity, every age group, uh, featuring all of the Latin American experiences in the city. So you were worried about the questions I was going to ask. Here's the softest softball question I can ask. Why, why is Dialogo Abierto uh, so important to the um, Hispanic community in the Bronx? You, you wake up thinking about this every day. I know that. It's, it's not very easy to answer in the sense that no one asks these questions, Gary. Oh, well, so I am glad you're job. asking that's what them. I do. That's of course. What we do. I think the program for, I think, about 27 years now or so, 1995, that was when it premiered, serves a vital role for 
incoming emerging immigrant Spanish speaking communities. The Bronx is known as the gateway for new communities and the, the program serves a vital role in introducing these communities to the local realities, local resources, um, why are things the way they are and empower them so they can choose what's best for themselves and their families in, in their own language. I was just gonna use the same words, in their own language. Um, you and I were talking about this um, on the phone and then just before the program. Uh, I, and I'm gonna tell you this story and you know this like you know your own name. I talk about this all the time. Um, there are 1.4 million people here in the Bronx you know how big Boston is? How many people? 600,000. But Boston has network television, has daily newspapers, and, and media all the time and all around them. In the Bronx, yes, we have media, but it's New York City media. We have BronxNet, we have News 12, we have, what, three weekly newspapers and two uh, not-for-profit, or, or two, I think it's two commercial uh, weekly newspapers, two not-for-profit newspapers. I mean, we're completely underserved by media. That's what BronxNet is about, and I know it's why you've made the commitment here. I have a major concern about the direction of mainstream commercial media. Um, I think um, media is still undergoing a massive transformation from what it was when you and I started or when we even studied it. Um, I think now media... Be careful, be I'm older than you. Right, <laughs> slightly, <laughs> probably slightly. Um, I think media now becoming more corporate driven, mm -hmm. more conglomerates. Um, it's the, the, the messaging, the content that is being put out is very homogenous, intended to apply across the board. And in the process, I feel it has made our communities virtually invisible in their own backyard. You know, if somebody asked me the question, I probably would answer it in exactly the same way. I tell people all the time, people from outside the borough, nobody knows who we are. We have 1.4 million people. And for me, and, and apparently for you as well, it's a weekly chance to discover who we are. And what you talked about, homogenous TV, they don't go to Burnside Avenue. You know, they don't go to 148 9th Street and see, you know, the people who get off the train and what's it like for all the people around there. I mean, it, it, it really is um, vitally important that we have that. Um, let's talk about the creation of the new show. This is something I know BronxNet wants to promote it. I want to promote <laughs> it um, because this is very important. Uh, our home, our haven, safe streets. What do we got? What is it? Uh, basically, it is a series of uh, conversations with um, stakeholders with the issue of gun violence, going beyond the sensationalistic headlines when a crime occurs. And, we, and the homogenous presentation, I'm using your <laughs> word, that is made in media about who we are, et cetera. I'm gonna, just gonna interject one more <laughs> thing. I, I saw a thing on a Nostalgia Bronx page that somebody who left the Bronx was coming back and wanted to know if it was safe to walk on Fordham Road or Arthur <laughs> Avenue. And I'm like, I actually walk through there all the time. It's a great place to walk. And we walked to Arthur Avenue and, and then somebody said, well, go have lunch, don't have dinner. What are they spreading? It's insane. Go ahead, I'm sorry, I, I, I couldn't resist. It's crazy. I think, um there's, it's no secret that gun violence has gone off the roof um, in recent months and years. But I think platforms like BronxNet can help fill the voids in the conversation. So rather than rehashing the conversation as it is being presented in the mainstream, we have the platform and the ability to make it hyper-local and really discuss the subject as it applies to local communities as it is lived in Burnside or in the hub and other areas as well. And bring these perspectives and opinions and experiences that a lot of people are not aware. That they will read about in some national media. We have a clip that um, explains perfectly, illustrates perfectly what you just said. So this is uh, from uh, the new show on BronxNet, Our Home, Our Haven, Safe Streets, featuring host, uh, um, uh, Javier Gomez, and also we should say produced by Audrey Duncan. Take a look. Eve was telling me of camera before we began filming that she wanted to talk about this specifically because she feels that society has become desensitized to violence and that it all seems like a movie. But in her case, she says it's not like a movie, it's very real. Can you tell me a little bit about that sensation? I have to go home every 
day, I was telling the DA earlier, and I tell our president that texts me and call me almost every day, that when I go home now, it's hard to enter my, my, my home because my son is not inside physically. I used to go home and he would be there or I would expect him home. But now it's just, he's not there. It, it, it's, it's, it's real, you know, it's not, it's not a movie, it's, it's, it's real life. It's not gonna end with an happy ending or it's not a script, it's life. It's what we go through every day. Wake up 2 a.m. in the morning forgetting that he's dead. Running to his room, answering him because I hear him calling me. You know, calling his phone. I still call my son's phone because I'm expecting him to answer. It is not a movie. It's real life. It's something that people have to go through. We have to live with it. We have to live with expectation that's not there. Still go to the grocery shop, buy things that he likes. Still walk in the mall, want to pick things up for him. It's real life behind the headlines. Yes, it's not a movie. Well, like all of us, you take a deep breath at that. It's just, um, it, it's heartbreaking. And, and this is the importance of what we're doing because this woman and this vital voice is not seen anywhere else. The issue of gun violence is very complicated. It's pervasive, yeah. And the team at BronxNet, Audrey, Michael Max, Walter in Creative Services, they uh, determined that we really cannot continue to discuss the topic superficially as other people are. It's our responsibility to bring it further. So these conversations include major stakeholders, lawmakers, the district attorney, the borough president, survivors of violence, uh, families who have been impacted by violence. We're, we're going to put up on the screen uh, when all these the, the program is on. Um, it, this, like all of our programs, is so important. I want to change direction before we run out of time. You are a filmmaker, <laughs> and I did not know that. And um, so I, I just want to show this clip, a part of a documentary. You acted in this. This was a piece about homelessness, and you were fantastic. We can't show the whole thing. It's about 13 minutes long. But just take a look at this film that you, you produced, directed, acted. Uh, uh, produce and acted. Oh, produce and acted, okay. <laughs> Let's take a look. This is, it's called Homelessness. Or homeless. 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 Take a look. Can I have a dollar? Thank you. Here you go. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, let's go. We don't want to be late for school. Okay. I'm clapping for Javier, but not for the situation. Where was that shot? That was filmed in Union City, New Jersey. The commissioner of culture in that town uh, is a former actor, Lucio Fernandez. I think he still performs, and he's very collaborative when it comes to create um, content creators. Was it difficult to change the skills you had? Now we're going through it. Uh, Bronxnet Television, working in politics, uh, and, and you know, doing all the things that you did. Uh, to, to create films and do that? It wasn't that difficult in the sense that there are two 
pillars that inform it all. Number one, storytelling. It's always the same commitment to storytelling. It's just uh, the medium that changes. And number two, everything is informed by a very strong sense of truthfulness and honesty as well. Um, this uh, short film, a lot of people don't know this, but I'm a trained actor, have a conservatory degree. Wait a minute, wait a minute, I can stop the music. <laughs> yes, I have a conservatory I degree no in acting, a Meissner acting, and some people see me in commercials. I, I uh, have yes, not done that. on television, we, we, and we, we, they know, tell me on the street, and they tell me, correct. So, uh, so, so you were able to, to do that character. I, I don't want to run out of yes. time. I so wanna... that's becoming a, a short film series now with Invisible People, a not-for-profit that raises awareness. The film is available online for free. Everyone can see it. The second installment is already um, available there. Wow. And the third installment is called uh, Eviction, was just well, coming in Vegas. Do? We'll invite you to the Bronx Buzz and we'll show off that stuff too. Great. I can't stop. Neither can he. <laughs> um, anything, anything you'd like to do that you haven't done yet? Like, do you have plans for the future to do something else? Or are we just, like me, just doing the same thing and doing it better as you can? Well, it's very important to do things that we love. So. Um, I want to continue um, engaged in doing projects that help the conversation move forward, projects that are fair in their content and that speak to truth to what's happening in the real world um, from every perspective, not one-sided stuff. Let people make up their minds. The audience is, is very intelligent. So they, they get it. They just need to be fed information. They'll decide. The best idea wins. The, you know. Um you, you say the audience is intelligent. People in the Bronx, which I have learned for many years of sitting in this seat, you can't fool them. And if you, you know, you mentioned tell the truth, it harkens back to what Freddie Ferrer told you, and that was a lesson you learned right away. Um, uh, now we're going to do something really fun. Favorite restaurant in the Bronx? Oh my goodness, City Island and Little Italy, neighborhoods. Oh, and also neighbors. in the South Bronx, there's uh, a, a, a few Mexican uh, restaurants popping up that are very good to check out. Okay, well, you ask me the same question. Uh, your favorite restaurant uh, in the Bronx. Listen, I, I go to all the same neighborhoods and I've probably been to all those places. Uh, I'm a big fan of the Kingsbridge Social Club, uh, uh, nice. which is right next to the, have you been there? Yes. Uh, it's, it's just a very funky place. The prices are right, the pizza is great. Great excellent Parmesan in there. Yeah, there you go. Uh, <laughs> the great Javier Gomez, um, just keep following him, follow what he does because uh, it's all about us here in the Bronx, and uh, thank you so much for thank joining Thank you, me. Gary. It is a joy to be here and finally sit in this chair. In it's this, really a privilege. That chair. Uh, listen, <laughs> we inspire each other. Uh, folks, thanks to our producers, um, and uh, uh, Rebecca Hemick and Stephen Powell. Our director is Benaya War. Uh, we come back, just like he does, we come back every week, and we'll do another show next week. And uh, guess what's going to happen? We'll see you then. Good night. Thanks to Javier for everything he does. <laughs>